Okay, great. Can you see the presentation? Crystal clear. Okay, excellent. Um, so, uh, my name is John. Um, I grew up in rural Alberta, an hour east of Calgary on a uh, Hutterite colony. I'm not sure if people know what that is, but they live kind of like uh, the Mennonites, as in they, uh, their Christian background uh, of the Anabaptist religion. And uh, there would be about up to 120 members co-optively uh, co owning and running a farm business enterprise. So raised in a big family, uh, nine siblings, large-scale conventional grain and animal farms. Um, the conventional grain uh, total acreages, I think we farmed about 12,000 acres. And then animals, uh, large-scale animal farm. And sad to say that it was all commercial grain and animals. So yes, pesticides, herbicides, all that sort of stuff. So I've sprayed and used and been around enough chemicals and bad agriculture to last me a lifetime and many more and for others. So that's how I was raised. Um, I left at age 16 to go work in the oil patch, lots of oil patch in Alberta uh, for the next 10 years. Then I moved to Kelowna where I met my partner, Brenda, and we had a couple, um, couple of years where we had backyard, uh, backyard, gardens, I guess you could say, and I got interested in farming. I got interested in real food again. I would shop at the farmer's market religiously every Saturday. I got, I got to a point where I wouldn't buy anything other than from the farmer's market. So that got me into thinking about that, uh, doing that again. I worked as a builder, renovator, uh, and for a couple of years, and once we started farming, we, I was full-time farming for the next, I should say, five or six years, I guess, full on. And then I scaled back the farming a little bit and did a bit more construction because Brenda started taking over more of the farm duties. Uh, and then I would just be there as, uh, helping to streamline stuff and build elsewhere. Uh, my passions are improving efficiencies. I love tracking stuff. I love to dial things. I do not like to see people struggle with something that can be done much easier on the body, uh, on the mind, and in any which way, shape, or form, efficiencies can come in. I love to tool build. I've built multiple tools for our farm to improve efficiencies, to help us dial certain things. Um, and my goal is to continue building tools. In fact, I'll probably start a company, uh, tool building company, and you might see my tools out here in the next little bit. And then the other thing is uh, I, I'm passionate about helping farmers improve their livelihoods. Uh, what I mean by livelihoods is helping them earn a living that's more than just getting by. Most of the farmers that I know don't really make a lot of money. It's unfortunate that farmers have gotten us down, that, that farming has brought us down to, I don't know, the stigma of farming is kind of a thing that nobody really wants to do anymore. And so little kids don't grow up saying that they want to be farmers anymore. And that's sad. Um, so that's what I'm here to hopefully my, in my future, in my future life here is to help change that and make farming a little bit better. Hi, everybody. My name is Brenda. Um, I grew up uh, probably the most opposite way that um, John could have. Um, I was raised by a single father. Um, in North Vancouver with my sister um, in a condo. So we only ever had like a tomato plant every probably three years or something in a pot. Um, so yeah, really no, you know, no, you know, raised with no connection to, to where food came from. It was really just something that was somewhere deep inside of me. I always wanted to live on the land. Um, I, I was um, really passionate about natural medicine and um, 
uh, you know, did some exploring in my early 20s and that led me to coming to the Okanagan Valley from North Vancouver and I fell in love with being outside, um, you know, just exploring um, the natural environment. I loved it. So I did a lot of fruit picking just so that I could basically be outside all the time, live outside all the time. Um, uh, I had my son when I was in my late 20s. And, um, you know, did a lot of a lot of gardening everywhere I everywhere I lived, I always had a garden. Um, and uh, was really passionate about that. And when John and I met, um, as he said, um, you know, we had a garden ourselves and, you know, started, um, started our farm venture. I won't get into too much detail. My background was in um, natural health. I worked at a health food store for 19 years. I've worked in retail most of my life. So my, you know, that really helped, I think, um, us in our customer relations, because um, that's where that's where my strong suit was, was um, understanding, um, you know, what people need, what people want, and how to communicate with people. And I think that's a really big component because a lot of farmers can be good farmers, but they're not necessarily great salespeople. Um, and, um, and John and I, I think through our co combined um, experiences, um, you know, definitely had some pretty strong, strong points that way. Um, I'm passionate about everything to do with plants plant spirit medicine, plant, you know, um, I'm, I'm just a total plant geek. I love to know everything that I'm looking at when I go for walks in the woods. Um, so when I say exploring, I guess that's about it. Um, traveling, I love to travel. Um, and um, yeah, I love everything to do with dance. <laughs> that's me. Excellent. Um, so our journey into farming uh, was actually by an awesome book by John Jevons. I highly recommend anybody getting this book. It's actually written more towards uh, gardeners or homesteaders and how to be veg, like, uh, sorry, uh, food independent. Uh, he's got all kinds of scales in there. But it's a book on how to farm biointensively. Uh, biointensive is biologically rich soil that allows you to increase yields build soil fertility and using less water. Um, so the book is, it's got a long title. You'll find it there. It's the picture there, how to grow more vegetables. And then it keeps going to say on as little land as you can possibly imagine. And in a sense, it's square foot gardening in a nutshell. It gives you, it has a beautiful charts inside of how much square spacing each plant wants, what are expected yields, uh, tells you how to do a double dig system, like a wonderful, wonderful book. I'm actually surprised that it's not quoted as more uh, as, 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 a, as, as a good, great book because it comes on the heels of who's that other person who, who learned from uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner style stuff. Anyways, it's, it comes from, it, it comes from a guy, John Jevons. He's, he's uh, apparent. I think he used to also teach in California in a university or something. I've ran on, across a couple of people that know about him. So anyway, square foot gardening on a commercial scale is what we decided to do, which was taking John Jevons' small farm approach and taking all those plants that needed X amount of square inches or square feet of space and just adapting it to small, uh, to a commercial scale, which is why we got interested in spin farming. Our friend Curtis Stone there uh, got into spin farming a year before us. So spin farming is small plot intensive and it was new on the scenes and it was great because it standardized the beds. So now you, we could take square foot gardening combine it with a standard sized bed. And now you could actually do square foot gardening on a commercial scale, which really appealed to me because I love numbers and I, I, I like to see things in pictures, big pictures. And so I could quantify everything that way. I know that a 50 foot bed by 30 inches has 125 square feet. So if you, if a carrot needs four square inches, do the math, you can fit roughly, I forget what it is, like 3000 carrots into a bed as a simple numbers thing. So that's how we got into farming. It's a um, really cool book. Highly recommend uh, looking into it. 
the evolution of our name. Why don't you do this one? Uh, yeah, probably because I, I, I chose it. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we started out, we were, you know, humming and hawing, we didn't have a location specifically. So we were like, okay, what are we going to come up with a name? A lot of people, you know, decide on a name based on their, on their, you know, where, where they're located. Uh, for us, I wanted it to be something that could move with us. And we had, we had watched some movie um, about some farming in New Zealand and I was inspired. I think it was, they had some name, it was called Gooby, but it was with three O's. Um, Ubies. Ub or Ubies, yeah, they were the Ubies. I can't even remember exactly what it stood for, but something about organically in our own backyards. And I thought it was pretty great. So anyways, I came up with Gooby Gardens. Um, grown organically in our own backyards and and we 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 are still affectionately known in Kelowna by some of our previous customers and friends as the goobers um you know um yeah as uh, that was what we were for a couple of years but then um yeah after a couple of um after four what by fourth year um we decided to change our name and it was probably the best thing that we ever did um it was like we grew up um as farmers because um once we were wiser farm we were like we were on the menus of, of many of the, you know, top restaurants in town and it, you could find us in cookbooks and stuff like that. So, you know, I, th I think, you know, a, a name is really important, um, you know, just depending on what you want to do with your farm. Uh, great. So our growing season, uh, First few seasons, we had super early springs. Uh, I remember building our greenhouses in middle of February in a t-shirt. And that was great because we're like, wow, we're farming. We can farm stuff in February. This is awesome. And then six years later, there was snow on the ground in April still. So that was a bit of a, um, a culture shock or a um, season shock. So our first few seasons were early springs. Our starts in the nursery were early February. I think we even started one year where we started plants in January 27th or something. And then they would be planted out four weeks later. Uh, sales uh, usually started at the start of April until late December. Uh, those few years, sometimes we'd have tomatoes in the ground by almost the end of April, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was actually, we've had, we had a couple seasons where we could have tomatoes in the ground, in a cold frame, not a greenhouse, a cold frame. So strictly covered uh, before the end of April. So, but that's Kelowna, it can get quite warm. Uh, but then six, year six onwards, we started, uh, our season started later, colder springs. Uh, we did try some earlier years prior to that, but we just kept failing. So failing crops, uh, we'd put them out, they'd take forever to get going. The, the second planting and the third plantings would catch up to the first ones. So we just learned that we just had to go with the seasons and to stop trying to push the seasons that much and just go with what is. Um, so what we ended up doing, our starts now, then became uh, early March, uh, starts in the greenhouse early March, plant out early April, sales started late April into December, and then sometimes our sales didn't start till May. Uh, now, what we really wanted to do is we started our seasons later with a focus on fast full field production for a reason. That was, we wanted to catch up to those years where we made where we had early sales because we knew we had those sales so we had to catch up with those sales before because they were like 10 or 15 or twenty thousand dollars and so the only way we could do that is by starting a month later but then starting with a bigger bang so that required us to plan out the whole season so that our fields were 100 percent used in production by I would say first part of June and then we'd rotate stuff around before that we would slowly build ourselves up to full production and then we'd have our first couple months would go from you know $1,500 income up to four thousand seven thousand slowly but our last couple of years we ramped up and we tried to get to like a seven thousand um, dollar month right off the get-go so starting the season strong is great for income 
seven thousand uh, dollars no for a month okay oh no no weeks no, you're week, right you're week, absolutely yeah. right sorry so, i'm getting my numbers week, yeah um so starting the season strong is great for income if you do it that way because you just it, it's it's good for your energy because if you see income coming in you get a passion for farming you want to keep going when you spend money it's not so fun in farming and then it creates longer seasonal jobs for your workers for our workers and then it evens out the monthly income and have it instead of having super high spikes in the summertime trying to reach those best ever weeks we simply try to bring all weeks up and buffer everything else so our goal basically was to stop the super high bell curve in july and august actually june and july and and then bring up the end uh, months of at least may and then uh, august and september bring those up so that we had a more even working day uh, as we went on why don't you go to that one you go ahead. You crops go we ahead. grew our philosophy was always to grow everything we like to eat so we were never a farm that grew just the expensive crops it never sat well with us even though we could have there was ample need for, uh, there was ample opportunity for that um, so we grew literally everything, almost everything that was in seed catalogs. Uh, in the early years, we grew lots of varieties and lots of crops. So varieties, we would grow four or five different types of carrots, five, four different types of beets, uh, beans and tomatoes. We, I think at one time we had like 15 types of tomatoes. Um, so it looked great and it looked cool on paper. But what we found is later years, we grew lots the same type of crops, but less varieties. And what it does, it streams on you. It, you, you only have to focus because each variety brings a different challenge with it as well. So what we learned is um, uh, we also uh, found the best approach was to be in season with the crops instead of trying to have bok choy all summer long and to... Uh, or try and have tomatoes from a super early till super late, we found that growing in season and growing enough of a variety so that people could have a cooking green, a, a salad green, a root, uh, a little bit of everything, it did the best for us. So we went from trying to grow everything all the time with a lot of varieties by using those same crops, but then staging them. So bok choy we would only do in the spring and in the fall, Sp spinach in the spring and in the fall, and then we'd switch to something else. So for us, we realized that that was, um, um, that was a big lesson is to not grow everything all the time and to just stick with what grows best in whatever season it grows best at. Our sales avenues, farmer's markets. Uh, a farmer's market was our very first uh, sales avenue ever. Um, in fact, I think the first couple of years, we only did farmer's markets. Um, and um, professional signage, we realized that at the start, we wouldn't have any signs up. People would constantly ask us, uh, how do you grow or they simply wouldn't ask you and if they thought that your stuff looked I don't know pesticide or or, or uh, um, um, fertilizer fertilizer ridden they would simply walk by so having a sign up telling saying who you are what your practices are had definitely helped in our sales and the other thing with with farmers market it's an old cliche is pile them high and watch them fly it works uh, when someone walks by a, when you when you walk by a stand and it's full of vegetables and the vegetables look great you have a tendency to come in you have a tendency to come and buy them if there is we always it's funny it, to try and sell the last item of something is almost harder than selling it when there's a big bunch of it because nobody wants to pick up that last item it's almost like 
oh, is that all you brought or is that the leftover or like that's it. So when there's only a few things displayed, it always almost feels like it's a leftover. So yes, pile them high, watch them fly is a great, is a great thing. Uh, CSA veg box uh, or standard versus a la carte. We started off by doing a veg box. I think we did it, what, year three? Uh, year three, we did veg box. So the standard CSA box, which is prepay it at the start of the season, promise something and then deliver X amount of weeks of X amount of value for that. Um, we found that to be actually hard because if, for instance, you have 50 customers and you wanted to put beets in there and you only ended up with 45 bunches of beets and the beets were supposed to be in the box, who are the five people that aren't getting the beets, right? So it becomes now you, if you have a CSA veg box, it becomes where you must have equal amounts of items of everything that you decide to put in that box. Um, you know, so if you grow, if you say that there's going to be 10 items in a box and you actually grow 30 different things, first of all, you leave out two thirds of what you grow and you have to make sure you have X, uh, enough of the ones that you're going to put into the box. So we actually switched to an a la carte system a little bit later on, which is we never even asked for money up. We, we asked for money up front, but it went in as a credit. And then as people ordered, it would take away from their credit and use up their credit. And if they needed, wanted to put more down, that was great. Um, so it ended up with a system, order what you want, when you want. So for people that had family over, they could order three times that much. And if they bought too much the previous week, they don't, didn't have to buy the following week. So we did have a minimum of, I think, $15.00 and then a maximum of whatever you want. And we've had restaurant or uh, CSA, or we call it a veg box. We've had veg box customers that have ordered uh, probably $150 worth in a, uh, on one week. So by, by doing a veg box, you're, one's actually limiting themselves. Uh, you know, a standard CSA, uh, an a la carte system we found made us more money than a veg box, than a CSA veg box. Restaurants, great way to sell. We sold to many, many chefs. Uh, building good relationships with chefs is the key because the chefs decide what they're going to buy from who and not the restaurant. So the manager of the restaurant or the even sometimes the head chef doesn't even decide. It's the sous chefs that, do, that really have the relationship with the farmers. So once one is in with a chef or with a restaurant, uh, it, it can be a really good um, a really good business. We've done really well with restaurants. Resellers, we've had um, uh, for quite a few years, four years, I think we had a person that took our produce into uh, restaurants, into the, the um, uh, Rocky Mountains, um, like Banff, Lake Louise, actually all the way into Calgary, even downtown Calgary. So that was our sales avenue. And then e-commerce, later on, we decided to go to local line, for our e-commerce, uh, it's an online platform. Uh, I, I know there's others out there. There's Farmago, there's other things, uh, but it works great. It's a Canadian company. And our last three years or four years, all of our sales went through local lines. So even restaurants ordered their product through local line. Um, not gonna go much more into detail about that. Uh, you can check it out. It's a, it's a good service. It, it's well worth it. All right, knowing our worth. Uh, like all farmers, when we started out, we didn't know our value. I remember standing at the first farmer's market and having all this beautiful pro produce. I remember we had quite a bit of beautiful basil, some basil plants. Um, and that sticks out in my mind. I know we had a couple other things. And we sold, I think, half or a, or a third of what we actually brought. And... At the end of that farmer's market, I was dejected because you bring all this stuff and you did all this work and you expect people to just be like, whoa, I want your stuff. And then they don't grab it. It's like, okay, uh, what do we do now? Because from there on, once it's at the farmer's market, once it's warmed up, you have to deal with it. It no longer is sellable. 
it's usable, but it's no longer sellable. So um, that was that was an interesting uh, an interesting lesson. Year two, we started selling to chefs, and how that happened is uh, a chef came to the farmers market and saw our stand and. She was like, oh, wow, do you have lots of that stuff or do you want that stuff? And I, I was kind of shy. I was like, oh, I don't know, like maybe our prices are too high. I don't know why I thought my our prices were too high for a restaurant. I, I, I don't even know. I didn't do no research that bad for me. Uh, but this lady or this uh, woman wanted some produce. And once she started ordering, we, you know, the, the order started going up fast and to a point where our farmer's markets then became the leftover, the way where we sold our leftover product. So not, not that we took our leftover product to the farmer's market, we would plan out our season then so that everything would be, uh, we, we'd, we'd have our plan for what will go to restaurants, what will go to veg box, what will go to the resellers. And then we would kind of fill in the blanks and move the rest to the farmer's market. So because our farmer's market was on a Saturday and all our other sales avenues were on a, were stopped on a Friday, we could move the rest of our product to the farmer's market on a, uh, on Saturday. So it worked out really well for us. Uh, year three and four, we really got sought after by chefs because chefs talked to each other. And, uh, you know, at one point in time, we were in 12 local restaurants and the distributor, I believe, took our product to up to 10 other restaurants. We had a veg box at that time and a farmer's market. So we were um, we were busy people. We were packing two days a week. Well, sorry, two different days of week. So we would pack orders on a Tuesday and on a Friday. Uh, later on, we actually moved our sales to an online platform, like I was talking about earlier, local line. And um, uh, farmers market sales went up. Restaurants started dropping because more farmers started to sell to restaurants and restaurants will try new farmers. Uh, you know, we at at the start, I was insulted if they wouldn't buy certain stuff, but you know, competition is good. It's good for other farmers to make a living. And at one point in time, we serviced almost all the restaurants and then other farmers had to come in. And well, so we had to move out of the way to allow for them to come in and, uh, and get a piece of the pie. So we had to carve out another piece of pie for that, for, for us. So we started learning our worth when we had to have consistent supply, size, and quality. Uh, consistent supply, the only way we could deal with a restaurant is by having a consistent supply, size, and quality. Uh, they want to know that if they put, your beets on, uh, put our beets on the menu for the next six weeks, that they're going to get those beets. They don't want to have them from, from us for a week, and then we're out for a week, so they have to go source them elsewhere. They want to make sure that that is there and it's good and they will pay well we got we got the, the the prices we asked for and all we all we had to do was make sure that we had the supply size and quality um how are we doing for time good yes. we're doing lots i was going to expand on something here a little bit but i forgot what it was it'll come to me i'll keep going all right, growing pains. Uh, that's new farmers. Here's one <laughs> that'll happen to you as well. So year one and two, we did the spin farming, multi-plot. Um, the, field, the field in the top picture there with the, um, you can see the watermarks on there. We farmed from, um, from the middle of the field. You can see there's a little bit of a greenhouse there to the right hand side of that patch there. So that whole area was about 40 to 50, 50 foot beds. Uh, our other two plots had, um, they were small, they were very small. We only had like 20 or 30 beds in the other plots. One of them was our own backyard. The other one was our friend's yard. And um, so we did that for a couple of years. But then it just became a hassle. Uh, Multi-plot was way too much work. I get it if one is in the city, but we had access to land that was very close to our house. So we simply rented this entire field. And it took us a while to use this entire field. 
Um, so um, year three, we built cold frames. You can see the cold frames in the second picture there. There is that double towards the left-hand side. There is a greenhouse that is 24 by 76, not a greenhouse, sorry, cold frame. That is a gutter connect. The next one, uh, the one to the right would be a 20 by 150. Later on, we rebuilt that one and turned it from 24 feet into 150. So we widened it so it would match the other one. And then the little greenhouse directly in front of the long one is our nursery. The nursery got built in, uh, in year five. Um, prior to that, we would set up our nursery inside the other greenhouses. We would put landscape fabric down and uh, build a little bit of a makeshift room, brought in heat. I'm sorry, I don't have those old pictures. I, I, I have a habit of losing my pictures on my phone. So I take pictures, but then I lose them. Um, so anyways, we used our, we built our, we had our nurseries inside the cold frames before uh, the first four years. And then finally in year five, we decided to build a dedicated nursery because the problem with building a nursery inside of a cold frame is you have to build it and dismantle it once or even twice a year, depending on if you're going to do a uh, fall season, fall season, and you use up beds when you could put that into growing. Now, granted, a nursery costs money. Yeah? If you set up a nursery with a heater with uh, fans and sort of stuff, that's, there's a bit, a bit of money there. So I would say it might be better off to build a dedicated smaller nursery at the start that it works really well and then expand. Uh, yeah, then, um, so that happened year, year five, we took on 10 acre, a 10 acre field, uh, which was uh, right across the road. Uh, well, that was a bit too much because our infrastructure, our packing shed, our tools, our equipment, our everything, our sales channels were only set up to do this two acre area. So grabbing 10 acres, we ran into a whole bunch of problems. Never mind the fertility is we now had to figure out how to get our produce in larger volume from the other side, from across the road into our packing shed here. Uh, we needed different types of irrigation. It required another pump because it wasn't the same pump house. Um, it turned into a nightmare really is what it did our uh, the first crop we plant and and the field flooded so when we first took on that field we planted out that um, sorry that that spring we had decent crops we only used maybe like 150 foot beds worth that first season because we broke the land and had to play with it but in the fall when we planted our garlic uh, we planted out 25 50 foot beds and it flooded the day after we stopped, uh, we stopped planting and it stayed flooded till the following spring in, I think, May. So out of all that, I think we ended up getting maybe two beds worth of garlic out of the deal. So I always keep saying is like, that was an expensive lesson. We easily lost like $20,000 worth of garlic in that in that one fall to spring um so it really started to make us think like why are what are, what are we doing here we at that time we hadn't even streamlined our old field but we you know restaurants wanted more more product uh our sales avenues we could always have more product and we're like well let's grow bigger well me i said let's go bigger brenda's like <laughs> no we need to cap this and uh, you know Listening to your partner helps because may, I, we made the mistake. I made the mistake for a couple of years of pushing it. No, we can do this. Let's grow bigger. And it just didn't go very well. So um, yeah, we just had to drop it. And it was a great thing to drop that because now we went back and we focused on our two acre property here. Uh, so when we streamlined it, we ended up with 320 beds, 50 feet long, 30 inches wide, mostly in 12 bed blocks. Uh, the 12 bed blocks, each one of them had a dedicated irrigation, irrigation valve to it. It was 
standardized to fit th uh, three tunnels, standardized to fit our irrigation. So it allowed us to move our tools, our tarps, our everything from one place to another. No longer did we have to worry about our 100, 100 foot beds in the other field or, or just, just weird stuff. It's good to be standardized. So the 12 beds uh, chunks worked really well. It, it started, you could time yourself quite easily with how long it takes to weed and plant and all that sort of stuff. Walking coolers, we, uh, we built walking coolers from year three on, I think. Uh, the walking coolers have been, were moved, I think, four times in total because our packing shed ended up moving like four times. Um, so walking coolers, two rooms, eight feet by 12 feet with a cool bot, uh, cheap to install cool bots, air conditioners. You can, one can change out an air conditioner if it goes on you or buy a new air conditioner for, um, you know, relatively cheap. You can set up a cooler, uh, cool bot and air conditioner for around, well, these days price have gone up maybe like six, 700 bucks, whereas a, uh, a compressor for a normal walking cooler could be upwards of five, six thousand dollars. So yeah, uh, eight feet by twelve feet, two different coolers. What we would do is we would focus. We would use one cooler as our uh, as our harvesting cooler. We would harvest all of our product into that cooler, and then uh, we would use the other cooler as we packed. So we would pull it out of one cooler, pack it into its sizes, label it, put it into the other cooler, and then put it into their section there. So when you when one did a delivery to restaurants, you could just pick up the um, um, that restaurant's labels, that all the totes loaded up, and away you go. Farmers market, same thing. Put it all together. Packing shed, uh, the packing shed you see here, the wash table there, the goofy picture is uh, 22 feet by 32 feet. That was our latest one, which uh, was built in, I think, year six or so. Uh, previous to that, we've did it in our backyard, in our, in our carport, in uh, a makeshift lean-to, and, and sorry for not having pictures of those old, of those old ones, but it, it was, they were growing pains. They were, but I lost them. So the packing shed and the washing table, which I would say is the most efficient thing one can have in a packing shed. The washing table was 24, 21 feet long by four feet wide. What it is, is it's plastic coated grading system that they use in hog barns. And then I lined the tables with a pond liner underneath that would capture all that water so that you wouldn't stand in water. And then that would all funnel down into a drain system, which you could just drain that out into your into a field or into uh, shrubbery. Ours went into the municipal uh, uh, sewage system through a sand trap. So we'd capture all the sand and then the water would just go. And that worked really well. A couple of wash guns there so people can work side by side. That also served as a, as a, Sorting table, we did have two more tables, those sizes, you can see those are two tables there. We had two more tables like that size that we used as sorting and packing tables, uh, as well as a packing table um, beside it. So we had lots of room to pack stuff um, and uh, organize stuff with. Where are we at for time? Okay. Tomatoes and trellising peas. Um, it's, they take a lot of time to set up. Trellising, you know, you have to drill all those holes. You have to set up the netting. You can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, the good thing about tomatoes is your, you know, once you set it up in your greenhouse, your uh, lines, your rolls, or whatever you use as your strings, they stay. So at least that, once that infrastructure is up, you don't have to take it back down. But with peas and beans and stuff, because we rotated them, we had to do this every, every year. So it becomes a question of like, is it worth setting up the trellising over doing it on the ground? You know, we had uh, 
on the ground, we had peas mold problems, that sort of stuff. And we just didn't like picking peas on the ground. It was just backbreaking work, flipping the peas shells over or the plants over. Uh, we got better yields with trellising peas and tomatoes. You definitely get way better, better yields trellising them up than down on the ground. All those are indeterminate, indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, the picture on the left, those tomatoes grew sometimes 14 feet high. Uh, we would fit five rows in a greenhouse that's 20, well, that greenhouse at that time would have been 20 feet wide. Uh, so five rows in 20 feet, and I don't know, volume, what we pulled off. Uh, but growing up gives you more growing space. So with peas, you can grow a five foot, six foot high uh, peas on trellising. Uh, works great. I think the Kootenays probably do really well with peas. We never did awesome with peas because it gets too hot too fast. Uh, but I would have loved to have to be able to grow peas in a climate that actually where you know you're going to get the peas. So if I were to farm again in an area that would handle them, I think peas would be one of the things I'd grow more of because they always seem to sell. They um, There was no sort shortage of uh, well, there was always a shortage of them and price was not an issue for selling to restaurants. BCS tractor, we ran a BCS 853 tractor. Um, there's a bunch of other models out there. A 30 inch tiller, we tilled our field the first uh, five years uh, because the model was get it nice and smooth and silky and sandy and it'll be great. Um, you know, the fluffier it is, the better it looks. Although the first or one or two waterings after that, it turned hard pan. And then it's like, oh man, now we can't weed. And then you had to run a stirrup pole through the weeder, through the beds just to try and kill the weeds. And so, uh, yeah, it took us five years to learn to stop that. I'm pretty sure Brenda told me or wished that we would stop doing that prior to that. But I was hard-headed and like, no, nope, that's the implements we have. We got to do that. Everybody else is doing it. And so we kept doing it. But our fertility also went down uh, doing a tiller. So we switched then from year five on, we switched to a 30-inch power harrow and a flail mower. Uh, the power harrow is much gentler on the soil. At first, we would go deep power harrowing, you know, up to four inches because we wanted to get that fluffy soil. But then we started just going barely deep enough um, to uh, get the cedars through and then left it that way. Uh, the flail mower, we would flail all the crops down. The ones we could, sometimes it was just, we wanted to be in the beds faster. So we'd rip, we would rip stuff out and then we would um, turn, flip the beds over quickly. But if we could, we would definitely uh, flail mow it and then power harrow it, water it, cover it with black plastic, and then get it into rotation that way. Our extra our last couple of years, we almost dropped the power harrow as well. And we were just using the tilter, the Johnny's 18 inch tilter. Um, it seems like it's a bit easier on the soil, but it doesn't, when, it, when the ground is packed, it's not as easy to get in there. So sometimes we would pull out the power harrow just to break up the soil uh, until we just brought in more and more organic matter where the soil structure actually started becoming better. And, um, and then it was just, then we could weed with wire weeders and with other stuff, with, uh, with uh, smaller tools. Sorry, I'm just still checking my time, making sure I'm, I'm on time with all my stuff. Oh, what slide am I on? Can you, can you grab a piece of paper? Okay. Uh, standard practices. Uh, standard practices. So by having standard beds, standard irrigation systems, standard everything, it, it leads to a standard operating procedures. Standard operating procedures can... Uh, can lead to efficiencies by, by timing the procedure itself and then chipping away at those times. So 
you need one one has to know what the standard way of doing a process is before one can actually increase that efficiency there. So what I mean there is once an SOP, a standard is set, then one can improve that standard by timing the procedure and then chipping away at those times. And we did that constantly. It's how we were able to save labor year after year. Our labor hours every year went down uh, from year five onwards, year five or six. You know, standard beds can set times for prepping, seeding, weeding, harvesting. So by having a standard bed, we could know at time how long it would take to prep, how long it would take to seed, depending on what seeding, how long it would take to transplant, weeding, what type of weeding it was. If it was hand weeding, it took longer. But if it was wire weeding, how long did that take? Uh, it was, if it's with a wheel hole, and then harvesting as well. Uh, one can predict how much the yields are going to be, how much the time is going to be. And then if one doesn't get the yields, then one knows if the fertility is bad or if the seeding rate was bad or what happened. So by having standard beds and practices, you have one has a standard to go by and then those standards will change but you have one has to get to a standard first right uh standard beds are easy for seed requirements and then harvest yields standard beds allow for irrigation to be moved anywhere like i said before uh standard beds and pr procedures helped us lower labor costs every year Every, every year. Um, if I look back at the times, I think our last year, we farmed the same amount of land than we did in two years prior. And we ended up working 15 or 1600 hours more that entire year. So we went from, I think, 7,000 hours down to 5,500 hours or uh, 8,000, sorry, we went from 8,000 hours down to 6,500 hours over two years. And I would contribute that all to standard practices, where we improved standard practices, and chipping away at just everything and anything that took time to do. Um, the biggest thing that we did was running our farm like a business. Our first couple of years, we did not do that at all. Um, our first couple of years, we ran our farm like the way, uh, you know, like flying at the seat of our pants. It was kind of like, oh, let's grow this and let's grow that and let's put in X amount of beds of, of this thing. We kind of knew what we could sell, but we didn't plan it out to that degree where we would plan out exactly when the crop would go in, when it would be su succeeded, and then how often we would actually plant all the different types of crops. We had a start to the season, and then we kind of fell apart in the middle of the season, and then we'd scramble uh, at the end of the season to try and fix the season that didn't go so well to try and hope to make some money to pay for all the expenses that we had. Um, so planned out our season later on in meticulous detail allowed us to know exactly when stuff was going to go in or if, uh, if a planting had to be pushed, if, um, uh, if we needed to buy seed, like how much seed did we have and did we have enough money in the springtime, um, could we put off buying the seed till June because in June there's still time for you know salad salad greens do we can we order seed at that time so it allowed one to play with your expenses and to um, um, to really dial your business you know it, it allowed us to forecast our expenses we forecasted all of our expenses at the start of the season um, 
everything from labor, when we would have to hire the labor, how many hours we would have to hire labor for, to how many rubber bands are we going to buy? How much, um, how many bags? What size of bags? Like, what are we going to do? Fuel costs, like, where are we going to go with our, with our uh, vehicle? How do we need to buy more totes? Do we need, like, everything. And if we missed something one year, we knew we had to add it to the following year. So by keeping records every year and then knowing, oh, hey, we missed that expense in here. And it might only be like a couple hundred bucks, but four, four times 400 is 1600. Or if say friends, you forgot one, forgot something for a thousand dollars. It's like, oh, oh there's a thousand dollars at the end of the year. Now that thousand dollars that one thought they had is no longer there. So it, it helps to forecast expenses and it will take a couple of years to dial that in. We learned, and that was a huge lesson, we learned when to hire. We learned to hire when we needed to hire. So even if we didn't have money at the start of the season, we went to family and friends, borrowed money so that we could hire people in order to do the work that needed to get done to earn the money at a later date. Uh, it, it's, it's a hard thing to get past, but when we did that, we no longer were chasing our tails. We no longer handpicked weeds as much. We no longer were late with our transplants because we had everything planned out. We had planned out when our crop was going in. So we had knew how much labor hours we needed to, to put that, that crop in. We knew what the cost of that labor was. So we just knew all the expenses and we were prepared to do that. So we started doing hiring when we needed to hire at about year five or six as well. So the first couple of years were rough. It was, I wouldn't want to turn back time to redo those years. Uh, it's, it's hard hard on the body, hard on mental, men, on our mental uh, focus and our, our personal lives are, you know, our, we're not married, but our marriage life was not that great because we were stressed to the nines. Once we ran our business and it started to work a bit like clockwork, it, it was just easier. Even if you go through a rough time, you still know what it's, what the outcome will be. So one can still predict and forecast, okay, we're, you know, the, 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 the season is going to be hard here for a while for the next couple months, but we know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and we know that the labor hours will reduce. And so we, we knew when we'd be in the thick of things and we'd let our, our staff know, it's like, hey, just a heads up, the next two months or next six months is where you're going to be going very hard at, the, at these times. We might work longer days or some days work longer. There will be times where it's going to be like, hey, we need to switch to this item. You know, it was a bit, a bit more scrambly, but not still quite planned out. And then it became, uh, uh, then it eased off. So when the, when the workers knew what was coming, they were able to go with the flow as well. Uh, but first, we had to know what was going on first before we could allow uh, everybody else to, to, to know where we're going to be. So we bought when we needed to buy. Uh, you know, we bought a nursery when we didn't have money at that time. It was early spring, you know, all that sort of stuff. And we switched to Monday morning meetings weekly. Everybody, everybody was included. We would uh, have a, I think, what was it? A one hour powwow? Yeah. Yeah. Every morning we would every, have every Monday morning. the leads come in early, a half hour early. We'd walk the field with the lead people. So it usually was three people all together. And um, we would discuss certain things about what had to be done this week, like what needs to be weeded, what had to be transplanted, just go over the, the, the weekly task. And then the meeting was where everybody had a voice. Everybody could say, here's the issues that I come across. I believe we can do something a little bit better. And we solved issues together. We would uh, talk about things. How to make it easier for weeding? Is weeding tough? Or uh, what's, what's this tool? How does this tool work? How does it work for this person versus this person? And 
we ended up um, just learning that people actually liked working together in teams, in big teams. We used to just do projects with two or three people at a time. And then it came into like, everybody wanted to bed prep all together. So if we had 25, 30 beds, people would be there. It would be agreed upon. It's like, hey, let's just prep the beds for four hours and then we're done versus one or two people taking two days to do it. So, so that Monday morning meeting and having, having everybody a say so uh, really helped us with morale helped run our business, run our business like clockwork and um, uh, just everybody had a say so. And again, we tracked every number we could, uh, that labor hours, expenses, uh, how much soil are we going to need? Like where we fertilized, how often, everything and anything we-, we open book. Op yeah. Um, uh, and then the other thing we learned about a business, running a business is wiped out crops when they were a failure or too weedy or bug ridden. So we learned that once we, we could see a crop, we could look at a crop and analyze it and say, okay, it's, it'll take X amount of time to weed. We know it'll have X amount of yield. Does the weeding outweigh the the yield of the crop because when one still has to harvest that crop so what are the expenses still to go in so if one has to weed a bed and still sell it well then it's your weeding cost it's your harvesting cost your processing cost and your selling cost just to get that product value off of it well sometimes one has to wipe out the crop and take a loss you know it seems like it's a loss but it's actually a gain because you're not you're not wasting that money there in in weeding it uh something i don't have on here too is we did run our business the last couple of years three years as a open book business so we shared our finances with our uh, employees we everybody knew what our weekly income was our weekly expenses what our labor costs were uh, how much everyone got paid everyone agreed that everyone's wage was the same, including ours, uh, you know, our wages them, uh, ourselves. Um, we, and, and it's, it's a, it's a business model that I like because I believe when people have skin in the game, they're willing to go that extra mile to get the job, the, 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 the pro, the, the job accomplished. So open book business, allows allowed us to show our finances to our employees proving and showing that we weren't millionaires we weren't making that much money really compared to them and so they 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 seen us on the same equal playing field uh we could we were no longer i'm working for you it was like we're all working together yes we own the farm but how much money we were making versus them at the end of it was not that much different. And so they are, uh, our, our staff really appreciated that. All right. Sustainability includes you. Uh, one of the biggest decisions that we made was to drop our organic certification in favor of using the paper pot transplanting system. Uh, Paper pot transplanting system is a paper uh, system, paper pot system that comes out of Japan. And it allows you one to transplant an entire tray through a paper chain system uh, uh, without having to have manually transplant it. So we, we decided to drop our organic certification to save our backs, to allow us to transplant without having to be bent over. And that was, that was, it was a decision we made because we knew we were, you know, there's glues in that paper that weren't allowed. Uh, we did research on how much glue that was and what it was. And we felt that to sustain our bodies, it was a decision we could, we, we, we could make and to explain to our customers that that's what we did. And, uh, 
and, and it worked out because we we transplanted a lot of transplants. Uh, we we started out making our own soil blocks blocks and transplanted them by hand, but then we switched to the paper pot the the the, um, the paper pot as the volume of produce that we grew increased our seedlings turned into thousands per transplants per week and it was just a daunting task to try and schedule in between uh, weather in between doing all the other things to transplant and we wanted to transplant because we wanted to get stuff in the ground early and to get a head start so it was it was basically like do we give up the um, the paper pot transplant or do we not do that and go to direct seeding or we do transplanting and then you know drop certification so we decided to drop certification and when we transplant that we transplanted upwards of 250,000 transplants per year I'll say that again that was, it's not on here but that's a quarter million transplants per year to do that by hand is is a lot. Now, if we did that by hand, we would not have transplanted as much either, to be very, very honest. So we did that because we wanted to transplant that and we wanted to save our backs and a bunch of, a couple other reasons too easy to weed and, and all that sort of stuff. We were still certified naturally grown. Um, so that's a certified natural grown is an American uh, institution that has very similar protocols to what you can and can't do as certified organic. Uh, it's all listed on their website. Uh, and so we've always been certified naturally grown, except I think the two years, the, the two years we did, we were certified organic. We dropped the certified natural grown to just be certified organic because we didn't feel like we had to spend that extra dollar. So, yeah, so sustainability included us and we figured we'd sustain our bodies over that uh, glue that was in that paper pot. In the States, that paper pot system is allowed by some certifying bodies, but in Canada, there is nothing, although it is under review and there is a hemp paper in production that hopefully is going to solve that problem. All right. Biggest lessons we've learned was finding our sweet spot. Um, we grew too fast, too much. Year five, year, sorry, when did we take on the other field? Year five, year I think. Five. Uh, it was my idea that the more we grew, the more money we would have, the more customers, the more happy, 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 all that sort of stuff. And it backfired. It backfired so badly that it was the best lesson I've ever learned. Um, uh, sweet spot is great. Knowing what your facilities can handle, what your workforce can handle, what, what one can manage. You know, two acres, farming two acres is... Uh, or, or a two acre field is a lot of work on its own. 10 acres farming like we would have done. Oh my gosh, we would have needed four people that were managers that could manage that. And we just didn't want to go down that road. So tracking our hours, uh, we never tracked our hours the first couple of years until one year I said, I'm going to track my hours this year. I'm simply going to track every hour that I have. And I worked it and I was surprised. At the end of the year, I had worked 2,100 hours during the growing season. So you can do the math however many hours that is, but that's a lot. And tracking our hours allowed us to, to say, okay, well, this is how much it takes to, to uh, run this farm. So now do we decrease those hours ourselves? Uh, sorry, do we, do we decrease our hours? And if we do that, and we still need to do the same thing, then we need to hire someone. So it, it allowed us to track who we needed to hire, when we needed to hire, and for how long we needed to hire them. So big one, tracking your hours. Borrowing money to stay ahead of the season. Like I said, borrowing money at the start of the season to hire someone was also a great thing to do because we were no longer behind the eight ball. We no longer had to do these crazy work uh, work days where we would transplant 
we would try and transplant five or 6,000 onions by hand, the two of us. And, you know, almost, well, we had prepped the beds the day before, but it was just backbreaking. It was just, we couldn't, we'd, we'd, Brenda would just at the end of the day, she'd cry and she'd be like, I can't do this anymore. I can't. And, and I, and I couldn't do it anymore, but I was a tough guy. I'm like, no, no, no. I was like, we can tough, you know, we can do this. We can just push another day. We can do this. But, you know, doing it two years in a row and the third year, it's like, no, enough. Enough just, is enough. There's a disclaimer. I do have scoliosis as well. So. <laughs> uh, projecting an income was a great lesson because now if we didn't make that income, we could look and say, why? What happened? What happened in the season? You know, we learned how to be great bosses. Well, I hope we were great bosses. We, we tried to be very accommodating with people. Our work days would be eight, nine hours max, five days a week, unless one ran a farmer's market and that would only be a couple hours. Um, we would split up the tasks. All the, the hardest tasks were given to everyone or to the strongest we would ask people if that task was too much for them or not enough or well, usually it's not enough. It's that not enough is not a problem. So we would, we, we would do that. We would ask and we would, we would find out, we'd find a sweet spot. We work as a team. Our goal was to always work as a team. And we learned that people like working as teams. They don't like to just be like, Oh, here's the two of you. And here's the two of you. We learned that people like to pick their own teams and to do things really as a big team versus a smaller team. Now that's, that was our farm with how we ran it. That's what we learned, what people wanted to do. Okay, one disclaimer. We were not profitable, okay? What is profit? Profit is monies one has left after paying all expenses and everyone. So we paid ourselves, yes, you know, I'll leave it at that. We paid ourselves. Sustainable wage, earning an income based on what a business can sustain, right? So we paid ourselves a sustainable wage because we only took what the business could afford at the end of the year. So our goal every year to, was to increase our wage, to make our wage move from a sustainable wage to something else. Now, what is that something else? Trade wage, you know, uh, every one of you who's a farmer can probably talk to a trade, to a tradesperson and quite quickly see that they make probably quite a bit more money than you do. And uh, so the question that I've had, I have, and I've had for years, uh, so earning an income based on what should be the normal for a trade, right? That's a trade wage. Well, farming as a trade, in parts of Europe, farming is a trade. Uh, Germany, it actually has. You can go to school and get go to school for a year and do uh, on-site training and actually earn a trade. So we paid ourselves based on what our business could afford, not what we believed we were truly worth. And the reason I say that is I'm a builder. And as a builder, I can earn, earn I can charge myself out substantially more than I could earn as a farmer. That's why I refer back to a trade is, is and I keep, I, I, it, it's, it's a big one for me, is we would pay ourselves more if we could have afforded to pay ourselves more. Now we paid ourselves more and more every year. The first couple of years we lived on what, 30 or $40,000 income, which by the way, for two people in a working season is nothing. That's, that's, that's poverty line. Later on, uh, Brenda's wage for a year was as much as we earned ours combined. So her wage at the end was $45,000 a year uh, based on 14, 1,400 hours. So her wage at the end of the year was based on a $28 an hour job. Well, as a, I call it, if farming is a trade and you're a journeyman, there's no journeyman out there that own their own businesses that make only $28 an hour, right? So my, my, my wish to you is, to all future farmers is do better than us, 
and streamline your farm to earn yourself a trade wage. It'll take some time, but it's, it, it's, it's so worth it. We need to elevate farmers back up to where we were once. I mean, in the Japanese empire, the farmer was second to the emperor. The farmer was actually classified as a top tiered person. Well, why, why has farming gone so bad? You know, why are we where we're at? So the suggested income, I would say, for a business owner, as a tradesman, as a, you know, as a, uh, um, a journeyman, I want to make sure, as a journeyman. So it would take, you know, it takes like five, six years to get to a journeyman state. But when one farms and gets to that five or six year stage, once my, my goal would be for farmers to get to that $40 an hour and more mark. That seems like a big goal, but I think we can do that. So we're, um, that is my wish for farmers. And I think we can do that. But the only way we can do that is by really dialing everything with this farm. So tracking numbers, uh, doing everything, running it like a business, doing, doing better than what we did, building on what we did. There's farmers out there, I'm sure, that do better than what we did. You know, I'm not saying we did the best, but we, we improved ourselves every year. And uh, so that's what I think we have to share. I will uh, stop sharing and then we can go into discussion. Hello. Hi, John. And Brenda. Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Is my share screen off? We're back to just people's. We're back to the Brady Bunch. Um, okay, thank excellent. you very much. That you really did such a great job of spelling that out step by step. And um, it was also such an inspirational note to leave us on um, regarding the living wage and comparing it to the trades. And so I just wanted to really comment that I super appreciate that and um, fully agree wholeheartedly. It's, it's where we need to go with agriculture. And, it, and, it, and it's really fascinating to hear how well you tracked all of your wages with your staff and, and that process. So at the end, you can say, we, we were tradespeople by the end of this career. We weren't quite at $40 an hour, but um, it's a really interesting comparison, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will open the floor. Um, folks can type in or they can just unmute. I'm curious why you folks with your successful farm in Kelowna, what made you move to Grand Forks? <laughs> can I answer that? Uh, yes, well, we wanted to um, by our own place. Um, and that was definitely not something that we were going to be able to do in the Okanagan. So we always, you know, I, I guess we always knew that that was, that was going to happen. That that was going to happen. Yeah, it was a long, it was a long term plan. And because we didn't own land um, in the Okanagan and the prices and prices just kept going up, um, you know, at some points we thought, you know, we speculated that we might be able to purchase the land that we were leasing, but that wasn't um, that wasn't happening. So um, we had looked at a couple of places um, as possibilities, and this was a um, you know the, the right place came up, and and it's nice because we're only a couple of hours away, and my son is in Kelowna, so we you know we still have the proximity to yeah. the Okanagan, which you know our friends and family. Um, yeah, but really wanting our own, wanting our own, you know, wanting to do our own thing. On a, yeah. on a plus on top of that is, yeah. like I said, uh, Brenda said, she does have scoliosis, so um, hard on her back. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both of us mid 40s and more. Mm -hmm. And vegetable farming is a hard life. So we don't know if we're going to continue what we're going to continue doing here. But as of right now, we're going to take this year, take a break, garden, back to gardening. And I'm a builder, so I, and I love to build tools and streamline stuff. So that's where I'm going to focus my energy on. And uh, yeah, my, my goal is to help farmers in the future with streamlining themselves, building tools and uh, 
yeah, farming related stuff that way. So will you, you'll be like a consultant in effect. Um, yes, yes, we're going to actually start a, uh, um, a farm consulting business together with where we'll consult about soil, uh, soil biology, and uh, I'll consult about farm business, like yeah. uh, helping farmers really dial their business aspects, uh, helping them create spreadsheets and um, efficiencies knowing where they can tweak their stuff and just and everything business related excellent that's great hmm. very interesting any other questions i had just one on when you were talking about your veg boxes and doing them a la carte how did you manage what did you use to manage those orders in terms of software or local line oh you use local line for that okay yes mm. yeah we use local line for everything it's um it, it's got a lot of stuff in it lots of tweaks but it works quite well for an a la carte system i don't know how it would work for a standard, standard yeah. csa box we never tried that um we just stopped doing the, the standard veg box right away. Uh, we only did it, I think, one season, and then we're like, hey, that's enough. So the a la carte worked quite well because you can set cutoff times. You can uh, set quantities. So you're in full control with that. And you can up your quantities once those have sold out. So if the start, if the start of the week, you only have... 25 bunches of something and then later on you have another 20 you can just add 20 to the existing ones and it'll simply allow people to then order them again yeah for the last few years the local line like with local line with our restaurants our veg box i would even i would even take our farmers market sales and i would enter in everything that we did with the farmers market so we had a tr um, we had records of absolutely everything that we um that we did through local line it was really handy you know you could tell you know how many carrots you sold in a year i mean they have graphs i mean it's quite for the price you pay in a year it was a really really handy tool yeah. they, they've done a good job yeah it was worth the money yeah yeah it, it helps you to project for your following year so you can tell how many pounds of each thing you sold and then if you bring on a new customer, you can simply dial that in and, you know, know where to plant more. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought it was maybe pre local line days that you did those orders. We did. We had our own. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We did. Uh, a friend of ours built our system online, kind of like a local line, but it was a web based system that actually did a really good job with it. Uh, even, there's even some features on that he had that I would have loved to have on local line. But uh, so we've had an a la carte system for quite a while, actually, probably like since year, year five, about something like that. But local line the last three years. And, and you sell it, <clears throat> you sell it like a CSA box at the start of like you advertise it at the start of the year, like like here's a yes. credit for your season or something like that we gave people the option so we would we would um, of course advertise to our customers and say it really helps us out if you can you know if you can put the money down at the beginning of the year but we also gave people the option to pay as they went um we were really we we went with as flexible as we possibly could and it worked really well for us yeah. and the nice thing is is about a veg box is that you're even if you're even if you're just getting um uh if you're getting the money as the weeks go versus at the beginning of the year people are paying before they get their product um so unlike restaurants which you may have two weeks or a month um to pay um you know the money's just it's coming into your bank account like you know right right away um so or, we, they, or they pay cash when they pick up yeah that was a small amount like it, it um it definitely helped with um you know with with having cash flow yeah cash flow um, was but yeah good. we for us we just found that going as flexible as possible um there was no commitment to order but people usually ordered they always yeah. um yeah and and like john says the uh, with the a la carte 
um, you know, then I wouldn't have to worry about having 60 heads of romaine because some people, you know, you'd have, you know, 20 people that want romaine, 20 people want butter, lettuce, 20, you know, they, they want a variety of things. And because we grew such a big variety of things, it really worked better for better for us that way. Yes. Yeah. I would also say that running an a la carte system, you start to see the trends yes. of what people really want. Yeah. You, you like we could predict almost to within a few items what the orders are going to be the following week like take four weeks out of the year in that time of year and we kind of know what was going to be ordered depending on what was available you know if a new item comes along it'll go like quick but if the item's been there a couple of weeks it'll start to diminish carrots will always be ordered carrots are the number one seller always all the time um, so, you know, and then going back to, we had people put down a thousand dollars and as little as a hundred dollars and as little as zero. So, uh, just asking them is it, it puts the, the, the ball in their court. And some people that have that extra thousand dollars, they'll gladly help you out. One thing I will say too, is we have never, ever given anybody a deal. So I've seen people, when I say a deal is, I mean, dollars off discounts yeah uh, you seen my disclaimer i already said that we don't make enough money so i have never ever said oh give me 100 bucks i'll give you 10 percent discount because at the end of that year that 10 percent is going to hurt you because you're already not making your worth right Farm we've already determined farming is hard so just be honest with your customers and tell them what you are and, 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 and then charge them what it is, charge the same to anybody. And we had no trouble with people necessarily wanting a deal. In fact, the best thing that ever happened to me was I was at the farmer's market and some person, I forget what it was, male or female, came up, we're, we're buying two bags of salad greens. And, and at that time there were three dollars a bag. And uh, the person's like, do I get two for five? I'm like, no. And next to him, next to them, who it was, there was a person, a, a guy, and he looks over at him and he's like, do you bargain when you go to Walmart? <laughs> End of discussion. Best thing. It's just your, your customers sometimes are your best salespeople. And so don't feel like you have to flog stuff or, you know, whatever. You're, you're better off. I always say that to, 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 to farmers. I've had far, uh, farmers come to the farmer's market and having a lot of heads of lettuce and then giving a deal two for one. It's like, well, you're going to sell the same amount because people are just going to take that extra one as a bonus. They're not going to buy more. So you're earning the same amount of money as you would have before, but yet you're doing double the work. And when your glut season is over, when, you're, when you don't have as much salad or, or whatever item it is, then your customers are going to come back and be like, why is it so expensive? So set prices once, stay there. And the people that want the bargain, you don't want them as your customer anyways. You know, just be real with yourself. Thank you. <laughs> I did want to say too, as well, is um, learning about business. Um, at the start, I was the main figure of Wiser Farm. I would plan everything and then give it to Brenda for review and kind of ask or kind of tell her that that's what we were going to do. Because that's I'm 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 a I'm a T1 person. I, I'm kind of like a bulldog. I go and go and go, and sometimes I don't know when to stop. The best thing I learned about business is who I was, what type of a person I was. I, uh, I am a visionary to a T. I will come up with new ideas. Some will be great and some will just slow things down. So what I learned in business is that your strengths at the start will become your weaknesses later on. And my strength as being a visionary became a, well, that field we took on. That became a problem because we should have dropped that field after the first season, but I was stubborn. And instead we had to lose 
probably thirty, forty thousand dollars that year, and you know, there we are. So, learning that the visionary cannot run the day-to-day -day things is the best thing that we've ever done. Brenda is an implementer, and I would, I'm going to assume that most women are probably more tendencies towards. Big, towards big assumption. And I'm, I'm saying it's a big <laughs> assumption, but I'm going to make an assumption. Most women are more the implementer type, the ones that, hey, let's figure this process out. Let's do it and let's dial it. I'm great at helping dial something, but I'm not the person to constantly go and do it because I will change things. And then the SOP changes. And then people will be like, hey, wait a minute, we did it that way last time. Oh, I found a better way. Don't, don't worry about it. So the implementer needs to be in charge of the SOPs. The visionary can be the visionary. They can, be, they can dream and do that sort of stuff. But ultimately, what happened with our farm is the buck stopped with Brenda. Whatever the implementer wanted to implement or felt they could implement as a team, because they would discuss it, I, as the visionary, would help them come up with those ideas. So my last year, I only worked 250 hours on the farm. The previous year, I did 750. The previous year, about 1,200. And then it kept going up from there. So we knew that three years prior to selling the farm that we'd have to sell the farm. So the goal was, how do we replace both of ourselves without being a culture shock to the new owners? And so by me eliminating myself more and more, the implementer, the next people will always have to have implementers anyways. So the implementer kept her hours, Brenda, and then we, uh, we ran it that way. So that was how we transitioned out of it. And then last year, we trained the family that bought it, which was uh, three daughters and one of the daughter's boyfriend, along with the daughter's uh sorry mom so three she's, three she's, sisters sorry yeah, three sisters she's not, she's just their mom owner. and they bought the farm and they had hands-on training last year and they're running the exact systems we had so hopefully they're going to do great we'll see how they're going to use all that information let's see how they work out and they had no previous farming experience well, I love the um, analogy of the visionary and the implementer and that the buck stops with the implementer. And I can think of right now so many farming situations where that division hasn't taken place and your example of you making changes and then maybe the implementer not changing the standard operating procedures to catch up with that vision and it being a kerfuffle. So um, I really appreciate thinking about that because so many farms are run in relationships or if it's not like a husband, wife, it's, there's always like a business partnership on a farm. And so knowing when to implement it in the business and when to not and just stick with the standard operating procedures. So yeah. I like that. Thank you. I'm going to use that lingo when I go to farms now, I say. <laughs> Who's the implementer? I want to talk to them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just a heads up, a great way to know who you are. So we studied EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating Systems. Uh, Gino Wickman, the book is called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business. Uh, so Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business is the book I read where I had to ask myself, who am I? And it goes through a scenario about like, okay, here's your business. Who are you? And I think there's another book that really spells out who you are, but that book talks about instead of spinning your wheels, gaining traction. Well, a lot of wheel spinning happens when two people argue or are not on the same page. You know, you might get along great with your partner, but if you're not on the same page, you're, you're, you're not gaining, you're not you're spinning your wheels. So yeah, check out EOS uh, as a business model. There's a lot of other great business books, but that's, that's what helped me. 
Fantastic. Well, and you guys are still together to tell the story. So <laughs> yeah, we survived. <laughs> the garlic farm, Brenda's still there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we never took the hose to each other. <laughs> Excellent. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, I'm sure that anybody who's going to watch this after is going to be like, oh, I should have attended live because I have all these burning questions, but they can also catch you June 6th. So some of my questions are related to soil health and your crop planning tools, because I know that you, you have some favorite crop planning tools that sound fantastic. And I'm also really inspired by your soil journey and that uh, through just experience and observation, you changed your tilling practices and I'm curious to know more about the tools and the flail mower and how you dealt with certain crops and uh, what biological indicators you used um, as you kind of went down the, the less tillage, more regenerative journey. So I'm really excited about that and um, I know there's so many other things you could talk about on the farm but um, that will be fantastic to review those. So Without further ado, I guess we can bring this event to a close. I will be uh, sending out this recording to everybody who registered um, within the next few days. So people can you know, review it then as well. And I just want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Brenda and John. I can tell how much uh, time you spent on that presentation. And I hope that it was also a rewarding journey to look at all your accomplishments over your time running Wise Earth Farm. It must feel pretty surreal um, how much you accomplished um, in, in your 11 years running Wiser. You really created quite a business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun, challenging, <laughs> and some parts I'd redo, some parts I want nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with anymore. <laughs> but it was, um, I still love farming. I still love food. And actually, my passion for food and soil has increased. Uh, my passion for farmers making a livelihood has just gone through the roof because I'm glad I, I'm glad I had a couple of years where we didn't make nothing because it made me really see what some farmers have done for years. You know, uh, and and they, they're, they're, it's this vicious cycle. It's you can't getting can't get out of that hole of debt or that hole of not being able to see past just the little things one sees. I mean, it's amazing how much of a blinder debt can have on someone, or or, or lack of income. Uh, right? It's it's. People that make a lot of money just don't see that. But people that see that that don't make a lot of money, they they don't see how much of a blinder they have on, right? So the, 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 the rich person doesn't see how much low income hurts low people. Really, it, it's it's hard to quantify because once you have money, you have money. You're like, ah, I could get by with a couple thousand dollars less, but to get by with less than what you need, so many farmers do that. Uh, you know, that year we lost 40,000 a year. I, we made nothing off the farm, like zero. I had to go work uh, construction and work all winter just so we could actually make our, you know, our, our rent and our whatever. So I'm glad we did that. Or sorry, I'm glad that happened. I'm glad it didn't happen for too long, the seasons. But yeah, I will. It. I will say that the beauty of farming, unlike other businesses, is that you, because it's, seasonal you get to step back and evaluate what went right and what went wrong a lot of business small businesses they're they're just up to their eyeballs all the time so you know like you kind of have those winters to go oh, okay what worked what didn't work and there is there is a lot although you're not making any money in the winter you you know there is some there is some advantages to that definitely to kind of reevaluate yeah right and you eat like a king or a queen. <laughs> or a vein. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, I feel like I want to share some of these messages beyond just uh, Kootenai farmers. You know, we can um, 
make sure that folks all around get that message loud and clear from the, the farmers' mouths themselves because mm -hmm. um, your story resonates with many. So thank you. Thank you thank all for you. coming. Thank you all for coming and right. have a great you, rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you everybody. Thank you. Today.